because I can see Kevin's joined us. Yes, yeah, so um, let's get started. Good afternoon, Chair. Thanks, Kevin. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Councillor Liz Clements, and I'm the chair of the Birmingham City Council Sustainability and Transport Overview and Scrutiny Committee. It's a pleasure to welcome everybody to this our um, December 2021 meeting. Um, welcome to everybody um, attending this um, informal session via Microsoft Teams and anyone um, watching the webcast. Um, first duty is to advise you that the meeting is being um, as I say, webcast, and it will be available um, as a recording on the Council's um, YouTube um, channels to view afterwards. And if there's anyone um, from the press um, or members of the public watching and who, who are, wish to record or take photographs, um, that's fine, unless there are any confidential items. And today we don't have any such items on our agenda. Um, just to ask then um, our um, committee manager, Basima, have we ha received any apologies for today's meeting? I've not received any, Chair. OK, thanks. Um, and just to say then for, for um, members and officers participating, if we just observe the usual um, etiquette for Teams meetings, if you could um, keep your cameras off um, and mute if you're not contributing and use the raise hands function um, to indicate if you want to speak. And I'm sure um, Basima will prompt me if I've, I've um, missed anybody. So ap apologies in advance if it takes me a while to get around, um, around to you. We've got... Um, Busy agenda today as ever um, with an update on Highways PFI programme maintenance, um, school streets and the, um, the citywide um, electric vehicle charging strategy. So um, uh, let's get um, into the meat of the agenda and invite Kevin and his team to talk to us about the um, highways maintenance. Over to you, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Jen. I'll, I'll introduce the rest of the team um, shortly for you. But um, yeah, I think just as a, as a bit of context and then I'll let... Um, uh, and, let, and let the guys take over on in terms of the presentation that we've circulated with the agenda pack. Um, yeah, so we took a report to cabinet yesterday on, on the on the broader aspects of the PFI um, about where we're going in terms of the future procurement of the project. Um, that's obviously still in its calling period at the moment. So um, we'll the, the uh, thoughts are at the moment, and, and I think chair we've, we've agreed this in terms of the work program for this uh, for this committee going forward is that we will come back in either January or February to um, give a more substantive item on, on where we're going on the future of the PFI once we've, um, as I say, once we've got that, those cabinet decisions through through the call-in period, which nothing contentious in there, but but I think that's, that's the right way of doing it. We've also got quite a big decision being taken by the DFT's investment committee um, during January on the on the business case that we submitted to them um, uh, last week um, on the future so the future procurement and the future delivery of the project so i think that will be probably a, uh, the, the best and most appropriate time to come and, and talk and speak with the committee about um, about the longer term um, prospect for the project so today is is focused very much on as, as you've said chair the investment program so as, as we like to know the sort of carriageway or roads and footways servicing program that um, uh, that, that members know know very well um, uh, but also uh, touching on some of the other things that aren't on on surfaces such as street lighting and um, our structures program traffic signal upgrades that sort of thing so that's all included within what we call the investment works program so uh, I've got um, two of my, my guys with me on this, so just to introduce them, and then I'll, I'll hand over to Thomas, who will run through the presentation. But So we've got Kamiyan Tavasoli with him, who's my highway services manager, and and then I, I Kamiyan. And then we've got uh, Thomas Clarkson-Williams, who's our uh, highway asset manager. Um, uh, and as I say, today is really about um, talking through that programme. Thomas will do a sort of 10-minute presentation now on that, and then obviously, Chair, happy to take any questions or comments after that. So over to Thomas at that point. Yeah, that's great. And I'll just put a note in the chat that, the, as you said, Kevin, we've got the, the update on the PFI negotiations themselves on the, off the back of the Cabinet report. That is in the work programme for January. So, yeah, that's been agreed with you. Yeah. Great. So, yes, great. Dick, far away. Okay, I've seen everybody. Yep. I'm just loading up the uh, the presentation now. Uh, so uh, uh, to this presentation is more or less giving us an update on where we are on the highway maintenance program, as Kevin said. Um, 
basically uh, uh, um, this has come about because of the uh, 2019 settlement agreement we had with Amy and um, it's based into operational services as well as program maintenance, principally carriageway and footway maintenance, including the, the other assets as well. Um, because of this, uh, the highways services team had to be 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 uh, uh, um, improved and augmented to to get involved in most most of the stuff regarding review of the output of services as the previously provided. We up upgraded our asset management team, and we, co we contributed to the technical and budgetary requirements of the. PFI outline business case, and principally with regards to the program, um, we are greatly involved in inspection, selection, and quality assurance of the schemes. Um, this is a slide I'm sure most people should should be uh, aware of. Um, it just shows um, our allocations for the different asset groups, and principally um, this position is more geared towards carriages and footways. However, we've, we've, we have invested a lot um, o over the past few, few years on street lighting, and this year we'll be looking at investing in tra tra traffic signals as well as tunnels. For the carriageways, uh, um, we spent 50 million over the past two years, and currently we're, we're going through um, the 40 million all allocation, and we're looking to spend for that 40 million when that's approved going forward. <clears throat> Principally, it will be focused on ensuring that um, the investment continues on the network in the interim and then and focusing on keeping the network safe, uh, which is a key priority for the council. Um, most of this is done through a collaborative engagement, but principally we we keep the uh, elected members consulted on the programs and any changes that we we envisage on, on the programs as we go along. Um, just to give you a brief uh, 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 of the process on the, uh, on the program development, as I said, it's a collaborative effort with all the parties and stakeholders involved, and we 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 go through it based on facts and figures we get from our surveys and our inspections. And the key inspections we undertake is a detailed annual inspection that looks at, across the network um, using some of our service providers who are. In, in, independent and are qualified to, to look at the, the network and they provide us with the information which we use. And also we use the safety inspection reports from our, uh, our current service provider care. And we look at all the complaints and petitions and, and discussions or, or, or emails that we've received regarding condition of the network from either the public members or any members of the team. We go through this to ensure that the, the right combination of, uh, of schemes are selected. Uh, we use a, a matrix of condition for the different hierarchies. Um, obviously, as I said, we look at complaints and, and obviously the, the cost comes into play. But, but fairly because of the huge backlogs we've got, <laughs> we just have got to sort of go by what's first and then ensure that um, we identify any other risks that needs to be addressed in our approach. Principally, uh, we make allocations for design, construction and supervision in the process, and, and we ensure that all designs are, are, are technically reviewed and in, in, in accordance with the, the codes of practice that we, we operate by. We ensure that the works are inspected regularly and then that there are appropriate supervision in place to ensure the contractor delivers what uh, um, is expected of them. At the end of the day, before they are paid, we do have an independent quality assurance process, and that is led by the independent certifier who's been with us for um, um, a number of years since the contract started and is quite aware of what is expected on our network. Briefly, I just men mentioned that um, we do have a, a team set up for, for this, and obviously it's it's a, 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 an area where the CC now has greater involvement in ensuring that um, the right things are done on the network. And um, we operate with BHL, Arcadis Care, and Tamac to ensure that um, the, the, the team termed the Integrated Partnership Alliance delivers what's required of them. Uh, so briefly, uh, the WOX program uh, in, in brief is, is more or less uh, about uh, the surfacing in, in this aspect. and. Um, the carriageways and the footways in particular. We have over the past two years been 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 collating schemes and currently we are looking at 
126 schemes for this year. Well, last year we, we did 199 carriageways and 209 footways, and this year we're looking at doing 80 carriageways and 46 footways within the budget that was allocated to us. The next year's budget is, 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 is has been earmarked to 40 million, but we're looking now to deliver this amount of schemes that we, we feel need, need to go into that budget. Uh, um, um, there are lots of stuff that come into play, so we are ma making sure that uh, we do that quite quickly so that um, all those that need to be consulted will be consulted be be before we start. There are challenges that we did go through during the past few years. Obviously, we're all aware of the COVID, obviously inclement weather, but there are major challenges in, in, in ensuring that we use the road space to the optimum. There are issues with natural changes. And obviously, because everybody wants to use the network, there are also traffic management and, and congestion that um, we encounter. But notwithstanding all of these, we we have done some, some very good work on the network. And as I said, last bit, been doing a lot of good work in the network has been been recognized by people outside of the, uh, the, 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 the council. Uh, first and most foremost, we have the Institute of Civil Engineers who uh, uh, looked at our processes and gave us the, the best team achievement award. Uh, um, for the 2021 regional awards, we are also nominated for project of the, of the project of the year for the contractors' uh, millions of annual awards. But um, unfortunately, we didn't win that one. But it was good to be to be nominated. Affordability and value for money is something which we don't take lightly. So we ensure that all designs are streamlined to use the standard highway materials, so that we can achieve more for less. Um, where possible, sustainable materials, susceptible materials that are changed to sustainable ones in order to reduce the long term deterioration. Because um, we want to make sure that going into the long long term contract, we use materials that will reduce the whole life costs. And to, to ensure affordability and quality of money, we ensure that the subcontractors are completely procured. But key to, to that is that um, Kia, who has been a contractor for since the start of 2019, was was uh, 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 competitively procured, and um, they are delivering value for money. One of our <clears throat> key items that we look for is ensuring that workers and users of the road are safe, and we do have regular audits on all the sites to ensure that things are being done the way it's, it's expected of them. There, there are instances that, that things do happen, but then we're making sure that uh, they don't happen anymore by putting processes in place. Um, so having said what we've done in the past few few years, I um, just want to sort of tell you uh, where we are in the next next program. Currently, we are, we are collecting all the information and definitely the list of schemes which we would have identified will be sent to all councillors towards the end of February. And we're aiming to ensure that as soon as the Commonwealth Games is finished, um, we will start to get the spades to the ground towards the end of um, August, when we, uh, and we said the contracts, contractors will be signed up for, for delivery of the, of, of the works. Um, I'll probably just leave it there at the moment because uh, um, that's all I have to share for now. Thanks very much, Thomas. That's the um, yes, very clear and very um, uh, very comprehensive. Um, I can see that Councillor Huxtable's got a question, so over to you, Tim. Um, as you might imagine, I've got more than one question, but um, I don't doubt it. I'd be yes, I'd be worried if you had just one question here, but go go ahead. Okay. Um, the first thing is that um, we talked about engagement with stakeholders, and I raised this issue with Kevin earlier on in the week. Um, and that is that I've been presenting, as I'm sure you've been aware, um, a, a lot of petitions regarding the highways and um, I've been getting replies back and it, specifically in terms of street lighting, they haven't been particularly positive. And as we were told at the members briefing, you know, street lighting should be the, the upgrading of the street lighting should be a no brainer because it's environmentally more friendly, the LED lighting, and actually has the potential to save both us and the PFI contractor a lot of money in, in the long term, you know, invest to save. So it ticks numerous boxes. And um, 
uh, I'm, I'm just I'm hearing what Thomas is saying about you know feeding into the process through petitions from residents and everything else like that, but the practical effect of it doesn't doesn't appear to um, be getting results. Um, the thing that um, wasn't included, and I, I think um, should be mentioned, is uh, the news uh, that I picked up about the Tame Valley Viaduct and the maintenance of that. Now, obviously, that's non-PFI. So I, I, but if we put it in some context, if 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 I recall correctly, it's a £72 million project, which puts it into context in terms of the sums of money that um, Thomas was talking about in terms of maintenance of the footways and carriageways on an annual basis. So, uh, as I always say, when we've got some really good news uh, in terms of the maintenance of the highways network, we shouldn't be afraid to share it. Um, and quite frankly, my residents, and I'm sure your residents and other councillors' residents, don't actually care who maintains it, whether it's the PFI contractor or someone else. They just want to be able um, uh, to drive on good quality roads that are properly maintained and adhere to all the safety requirements. Um, and uh, just one other thing is that you may recall I've been banging on about the state of hedgerows and um, trees, which again, uh, and the need for them to be properly maintained and the impact they have on the PFI network. Uh, and just just shocked that you know a city a, a council the size of Birmingham didn't maintain them for two years because we didn't have the necessary equipment as per the briefing note and again I would hope that um, this will be sorted out in the PFI contract and the um, investment strategy um, because we know that trees hedgerows any living thing grows and that will have an impact on the carriageway and it will have an impact on the footway, whether it's from a root perspective or whether it's from overhanging branches, um, which means pedestrians can't walk along the pathways or overhanging branches, which means cyclists can't cycle in safety along the carriageway, etc. So uh, I, I thought I'd throw all that in there. Thank you, Chair. OK, I counted at least three separate questions and issues there. Can I just ask um, Eddie to come in so that when I'll ask Kevin and his team to answer the question in groups, if that's all right. So, Councillor Freeman, what's your question? Yes, Chair, thank you very much. I was just wondering, uh, there's, there's two things. One, I've noticed uh, when we had the uh, Treasure of Chess Monet, we used to put some uh, new lamp columns in on Wheelie. And then uh, some of them are not 10 years old and they they, uh, they have been pulling them down and replacing them with their their new ones. And when we still got cast iron ones, we're supposed to be replacing throughout the city, especially in parts of my ward. Uh, you know, I'm just wondering why they're just digging them up. Uh, uh, let me tell you, uh, for less than 10 years old, where we so we got some of them 50 years plus, or some of them are still uh, from the old gas lamps, we still we put new heads on, and also I've noticed throughout the ward on my bus journeys that a lot of light burners are, have all been on in certain wards, and the street lights are, are on all day long. I wonder if anybody has picked that up and uh, gone forward to, to, to sort it out. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Freeman. So, um, Kevin, can you um, answer on those both both those sets of questions from Councillor Huxtable and Councillor Freeman? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go as ever. We'll go backwards, shall we? Um, yeah, just on, on the night burners. Um, yeah, so there are regular inspections obviously done on, on street lighting um, during the day, mostly at night, if we're fair, obviously about those that aren't on because that's the that's the priority. But as you say, Councillor Freeman, uh, wasted energy that those that uh, for whatever reason have got a fault that make them stay on during the day is also quite important. So I think a lot of the time we do rely on those being reported to us or being observed during inspections that the care carried out. So, again, if you do have any examples of that, forward them on to us. But they, they do get picked up on inspections. Um, but again, those inspections will be on a different frequency depending on the type of road. So 
some will only get uh, uh, an inspection once every six months. Sort of the more um, the more heavily used roads will get inspections uh, once a month. So it just depends where they are as to whether they'll get picked up on those inspections. So we do do nighttime inspections on street lights as well, but that is to um, and obviously pick up ones that aren't working rather than those that are that are on all day. So, but if you have any of those, report them through the normal um, process, and and Keir will pick those up in terms of um, street lighting faults. Um, yeah, the community chest money. I might just let at the end of this Cami or, or Thomas come back just on the uh, the process for um, selecting replacement street lighting columns. The cast iron ones I know are, are very difficult in terms of um, looking at the um, uh, the technology just to replace the lantern. So uh, they are more challenging, it's fair to say, the older columns that we've got in terms of putting modern technology in them. But I might just let, say, Kamiar or Thomas just come back on that in a bit more detail at the end because it's probably not my my uh, my strong point. Um, and I'll probably say the same about the hedgerows. I'm not aware of the hedgerows issues, um, Councillor Huxtable. Um, I'm not sure which briefing note it was in. Um, but... Um, but but say so Camion may know a little bit more about that and just come back on that um, in terms of the, the the problems with maintaining the hedgerows. Um, on, on the more substantive, probably the two substantive points Councillor Huxtable made. I think on yeah Tame Valley Viaduct. Yeah, we've we've just had confirmation uh, formally today um, from the DFT that um, the the funding that that uh, they've committed to previously. And again, this has been a a business case process through the DFT to secure that money over over two or three years now. Um, they've confirmed formally today that, that the £72 million pounds of their contribution towards the scheme will be uh, will, will, will be coming forward, which is obviously great news. Um, I think, yeah, we do celebrate the good news. Coming out, we'll tell you shortly, hopefully, that he's, he's just done a piece for, for ITN News um, and and that is that will be going out tonight. Um, and I, I think Council Zafar is doing something similar. So, um, so again, yeah, we, we we do look to celebrate those when we get good news. I think it's also worth mentioning that, that uh, as well as obviously the DFT's contribution to that, we, we've got £21 million pounds of, of, of our own money going into, into that, that work. I think the slight difference with Tame Valley Viaduct, and this is the... I think the terrible the terrible irony of something that's going to be a you know a fantastic scheme that's um, in engineering terms that, that is going to take us five years to actually complete. Um, it's so extensive. None of it's going to be felt really on the surface. So it, it, it's it's effectively a, a refurbishment and strengthening scheme of the structure, rather than and again that there, there will be some outward signs that, that things have improved, um, such as um, you know the, the final painting that we do of the structure. But largely, the bulk of that money is going into refurbishing and strengthening um, um, parts of the structure within, within, underneath the, the surface. So there won't be a great lot to show for it um, after we've done. But it, safe to say, it is, it is a, um, a, it's an extremely complex scheme, and b, it's one which is absolutely critical um, to the city in terms of ensuring the, um, the the long life of that particular structure, which is. Um, you know, in, in terms of where it sits in in the growth of the city is absolutely critical to to, to moving traffic and transport from the motorway network into the into and out of the city. So um, so that that's the real key part of it. And yet we, we are definitely making making a good news story out of it, as you'll see on on the news tonight. So um, there's that. And I think just finally, and, and yeah, Councillor Huxtable and I did touch on this earlier on in the week, but I suppose for everybody else's benefit, it goes back to something Thomas raised in the presentation. Which is, yeah, we're looking at a different way now than we've done. We did with, with Amy about how we identify the right schemes to do, whether it's footway surfacing or street lighting. It, that was very much. It used to be very much what we call model led, so um, extremely what I call sort of techy data led um, in terms of putting data into a model, generating out the answers, and saying right, that's the best thing for us to do. We've taken a step away from that. That was part of the problems that we had with Amy. Was was exactly that. Um, and, and that was the, the sort of crux of the problem that ended us uh, us going to court on it. Um, what we're trying to do now is use other data and uh, as a means of um, being able to identify where we put the right, put the investment in to get the right bang for our book. And, and, and petitions and complaints, as Thomas has said in his presentation, will be part of that assessment. And I think the important bit back to, to sort of Councillor Huxtable's challenge on that is really 
just because a petition is put in, that does not mean it's going to get it's it's going to get what what's being asked for. It will form part of a a bigger picture and a bigger set of data that will inform a decision. And that would include things like the inspection surveys that we've talked about. It will still include an element of modelling that we do on that. But but it will be all that the decision on where we go and put that investment in will have a, now an influence on it in terms of, of that petition and, and those uh, any, any petitions and complaints that we've got on, on the road. So so it's not to say, I think this is really important, that everything that puts a petition in is going to get a positive response, i.e. we're going to run out and do it straight away because that simply wouldn't work, that everything's still got to be prioritised based on that collective data. So some things you will get a response from us that says, OK, that's not in this year's programme, but we'll look at it for future years. Other things, once we put that collection of data together you, you, there may be a positive response um so so i think that's that that's the that's the sort of, sort of important message on that so i, I don't know i'll just invite cam in back or cam or thomas on 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 the other points just around replacement on on the cast iron street lights and and the hedgerows because i'm not too familiar with those don't know if they are but uh, thank you just on the hedgerows point i think Council Huxtable has and has been consistently asking a, a range of questions about the maintenance of hedgerows, and I think um, the, the 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 briefing that he that you referred to, Tim, was something that um, Councillor uh, Zaffer had organised um, for you in response, and the information came from Simon Needle. Oh, okay. okay. Um, Can, uh, Tim. Yes. No. Ab absolutely right, and also from the um, from the area parks manager. Um, it specifically regarding the hedgerows and the response I've got and I'm happy to share it because it's um, again a response to petition submitted by residents of Hall Green South Ward is that the City Council didn't have the necessary equipment for um, two years but they had uh, now obtained it and would be doing them. Well as I said tree we all know trees and hedgerows will grow um, just as a normal organic process. You know, and it's having a real impact on on the highways network and the stuff that should be maintained. OK, yeah, I think I understand that now. I understand where the notes come from there in that case. Uh, so Camille might be able to help on that. I'm not sure, but. Um... Yeah, go ahead, Camille. Yeah, let's move on. Yeah. Thank you. I think there are two issues that I just wanted to slightly expand on uh, on what Kevin has just said. The, the issues raised by Councillor Freeman and also Councillor Huxtable regarding street lighting. We are in the process of uh, prioritisation, providing a detailed set of priority ranking, as we have been doing over the years. And the priority is uh, process would identify the, the, the most in, the, the columns which require immediate replacement. I would be very grateful to Councillor Freeman if you could perhaps give us some examples of where relatively new columns have been replaced. We'll, we'll investigate that because um, certainly uh, our intention would be to replace all the stock with uh, LED uh, electrical electricity efficient items so that we would not only assist the environment but also reduce the cost of the electricity so if it's possible we would look into that councillor and uh, similarly councillor obstable you did refer to the the petition i think uh, kevin uh, covered that again in terms of priority ranking uh, we are progressing, we're actually looking at the priority ranking and identify what columns need to be placed first and then move on to the to the other columns. Um, in terms of the hedgerows and the submission that Simon Needle has made, uh, we need to sort of look at this in greater detail because um, I wasn't particularly aware that we had an issue. Clearly, you're right in terms of the growth of the hedgerows and so forth. But I wasn't aware that we had a massive issue here. Um, I'll pick that up with Simon Needle. And if it's acceptable, I'll get back to you on that. Um, absolutely. But uh, let, let me give credit because the areas that I've um, I've identified work has actually happened this month so 
you know, the immediate issue is is resolved. But I'm I'm thinking about the more citywide issue and basically how how we let this situation happen uh, in the first place. Kevin. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. Sorry, I probably have to have got as an old hand, but I think I'll just. Oh, right, okay. I, I was going to come back on that anyway. I think it, it, it's a fair point Councillor Huxtable makes, and one which is coming. I says we'll pick up with with colleagues in 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 parks and and the arboricultural team. But um, uh, I think yeah, as as far as I know, um, and again, Cammy, I can just shake or nod his head on this. That there hasn't, there certainly hasn't been a huge spate of of. Uh, complaints or inquiries that were no more than usual this year in terms of the um, requirement to, to cut back hedges and um, and trees. Um, certainly not been made aware of anything that that's you know, resulted from, like you say, what seems to have been a um, uh, you know, part of a service not not having the right equipment that's actually impacted on us in terms of service delivery. But again, that's something we can we can go and check out to see if there's any correlation between the two, maybe. Um, but yeah, it's a fair point. Council, that sounds good. That sounds like a commitment there from Kevin and um, Camille to follow that up. I can see that Eddie wants to come back in. But just before Eddie comes back in, I wanted to just make a comment myself based on that. It's good to hear you know, that we've moved away from you know a, a model driven um, prioritisation. But I'm just concerned about yeah, But then how you're balancing up the different, you know, the different sources of information you're getting, because you've said, you know, that, yes, petitions are one thing. But what what um, weight is being placed on reports from um, the Kia Highway stewards or um, individual local councillors? Because, you know, I, I think in terms of balance of my own casework, you know, a vast proportion of it is reporting particularly pavements um, and, and carriageway defects. And actually, while we've been talking, I've just had a quick look at the, the spreadsheets that you've now published online for the, you know, for the existing things that have been programmed. I think that's a great... Um, initiative and I think you know it's much more transparent for residents but then what it shows up for my residents is that there is some work planned on on carriageways but nothing on pavement so I think you know it will you know in some ways you know, that people get more information but they may then become more curious about you know, how the decision and um, how the decisions are taken yeah and, and I think that that's a fair challenge um the uh, as I said before which which was getting us in the wrong place with the investment decisions it was you know, extremely, you know, if, if we want to be um, sort of very data driven and, and extremely you know, clear on, on, if you like, scoring a road and then giving it a model data driven that, that, that gives it a score and you say, right, so those with the highest scores get done. I think what the sort of things those drove out, for instance, were that, well, should we be investing our money? And, and, and those that didn't pick it up, but on, on the table that, that Thomas showed, there was, you know, the, there's a lot more schemes in one year than in other than the year that we've just gone into now. And that's because we were doing lots of little pepper pot schemes previously on 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 previous programmes, because that sort of data driven, model driven um, exercise, which scores them and you say you do the highest ones at the high school, for instance, ends up with doing a lot of garage sites um, and 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 roads that actually are taking little if no traffic. So, for instance, there's no assessment made of the amount of traffic that a particular road takes when you're assessing the condition of it in, in the old world. So, so it, it, is, it, is more, it is more subjective now. So I think that, that, that's the weakness in it. But I think the strength, and there will always be, I think, exactly what you've said, Chair, the potential for people to say, again, well, why is, what, still why is that road getting a priority over, over the road next to it? Um, because there, there will always be a degree of subjectivity around things like inspections, you know, whether or not, you know, and, and sometimes visual inspections of a road, you know, a score, there will still be a score given to it by an inspector. And that can that can be better or worse, depending on sometimes whether it's it's just rained or it's 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 a dry day. So that there's always those things in it that will that will potentially result in a well, we don't think that that doesn't look and feel right. We are trying to take as much of that out as possible. By and I mean, Thomas mentioned things like quality assurances, but but other things in 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 the briefing as well, which I think he also mentioned. And I wrote it down just so I, um, I know what um, uh, you know. Technical review. So when we're looking at each one of these sites that are being put on onto the program, we're actually undertaking a technical review. To say, is that the right one? Does that feel right? Does that look right? So I think we've we've. It's not perfect, and I think there's examples that have been put to us in this program where, where again, the question comes to us: Well, why this one, not that one? And and there will always be a degree of subjectivity to it. But I think we're in a far better place with this 
than we were on the other model, as you say. Um, and I think over a period of time, we will get it get it far more refined and, and people will start seeing that we're putting the money into the right place and we're putting them into the right length of the road and we're putting into those roads that get traffic more often. Bus routes is obviously one of those those areas, again, where we're looking at the ride quality for people and, and the amount of citizens that, that are being impacted by getting a better surface. So all those things will come into account when when putting uh, putting schemes forward. And I think the final thing we've just got to say on that, they do then get prioritised based on uh, based on that, but they also, there also will be a cut-off, as Thomas has said in the presentation, about given the, the amount of money we have available. And I think that that will always be a point where we've got to say, well, you know, and again, going back to Councillor Huxtable's point, we can't do every road that gets put to us. We can't do every set of street lights in the street that gets put to us on a on a petition. But we will look to prioritise them and rank them uh, uh, and then deliver them uh, within the, the money we've got available within the project. Great. Thanks very much, Kevin. That's, yes, you know, very um, sort of... Um, helpful explanation of, of the prioritisation process. I think Eddie wants to come back in. Yeah, the road was, we, we when I was at Wheelie Castle, uh, well, the old Wheelie Castle ward uh, before they done the boundaries, was Castle Road. We had all them lamp columns replaced uh, about 10 years ago. And then suddenly, this is, I think it was on the, the edge of Amy, Amy contract. They came along and dug them all up again and uh, put their, their ones in. And I say lo roads like mine and other roads have still got the old cast iron lamps, obviously now way out of date uh, and need replacing. And I, I just couldn't understand it. And I've noticed as well, bits and dabs where the lamp columns are probably 20 years old, but they're replacing them again, obviously with the LED lights on top because they're the old orange lights. And I think, well, well, when there's still parts of the city still got the old original lamp columns, they should be prioritised more and the ones are probably 20 years old type of thing. And that's, that's that, that was my main concerns. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Teddy. Any further comment on that, Kevin? No, I think other than thanks for the location, as Camille says, we'll, we'll take that away in terms of Castle uh, Castle Road and Wheelie Hill itself to just give an explanation on, on why they were changed. I think, I think to be fair, to again, to, to, to a, lot, a lot of the sort of uh, the theme of what we've had over the last sort of five minutes discussion, we certainly on the street lighting. Um, we'll we'll look to put a short note together from from Paul Laythorpe, who's our street lighting manager, just on again perhaps just some of the I suppose the high level principles and criteria about how we've rolled out the, the street lighting program. Uh, that that might actually be helpful to uh, to certainly to Councillor Freeman's question about why why some of those decisions are made in certain areas. So we'll put together a little note on that as well on the on the selection criteria for the program. Okay, thanks. I can see. That. Yeah, I, I. Thanks, Kevin. I can see Tim wants to come back in, and I just had one question myself. Look, so, um, my question is: Is there now sort of policy position about replacing um, footways um, with with tarmac as opposed to um, fl uh, flag? paving stones because I, in the areas where it's been done in my ward I'd say I'm now a big fan of, of having tarmac pavements I've been walking around and it just makes such a difference so I'd be interested to know if there's a sort of policy position on that and um, Tim over to you um uh, it, it's a very quick comment um I again flagged up earlier this week um with Kevin and uh, a couple of lighting issues and Kevin said he would contact Paul Aythorpe Paul Aythorpe has come back to me very impressed and wish Kevin to uh, pass my compliments on to Paul for the work he's doing. And thanks for that. I certainly will. Paul works for Camiar as well, so I'll, I might give that task to Camiar. So, but yeah, thank, thanks for that feedback, um, Councillor Huxtable. That, that's, that's welcome. Uh, I think just going back to your point, Chair, um, on the... Um, um, in, in terms of the change, what we call change of materials, um, yeah, the, the way uh, the way we've got it at the moment is say as, as a again from an engineering point of view and from a maintenance point of view, I don't think we've ever made any secret of the fact that, that tarmac is our, our preferred material. That said, we, as we found out many times on many occasions over the years, that is not necessarily the will of of um, residents 
and members in terms of looking to change from flags or, or slabbed paving through um, through into tarmac. That that is still very much as far as we're concerned. There's no there's no straight policy decision on there. There are some issues I think as we picked up before on in conservation areas where we've got to be a little bit careful about changing materials from um, from some of the paving that's in those areas. But generally speaking, in in, in non conservation areas, it's it's still very there's there's no straight policy on it. I, I think it's where where we're going to do those schemes. If if members particularly have a strong view about one way or the other on it, we're still looking to through that member consultation process to say, well, this is what we're proposing. We're proposing to put flags back uh, or slabs back. Um, is is that what? what you want i think in those areas and, and and really it doesn't it doesn't bother us as as engineers one way or another whether we put slabs or, or tarmac back as far as that's concerned um i think we, we are looking at those areas and we have got a small uh, pilot study being run with kids at the moment about areas where we have continual damage and um, destruction if you like of, of paving slabs um that kids are picked up through their regular inspections and we're going to look at a, what we call a, a material replacement program for that, which is effectively taking those out and, and replace them for tarmac. So, so we will look at those areas that are damaged as part of the the, the, the investment works program, where we've got regularly damaged slabs, and say, well, our recommendation is actually that should go to tarmac. If, if as again as members, you come back and say to us, no, we want to keep those at slabs, and, and many members do, then then we'll respect that and put them back as slabs. Um, so that. That's as close as I can get to tell you what the policy decision is. We are very much driven by what the what the residents and, and, and members would, would prefer in those circumstances. That's really helpful, Kevin, because obviously, you know, as a councillor for, you know, for Bourneborough and Cotteridge, I've got you know, lots of conservation areas in my ward, so I'm very aware of the sensitivity. So you know, it's an important caveat that you've given that it's not hard and fast. But I think just the, the experience of being a pedestrian, particularly as the, you know, the nights draw in, I think it is an immaterially different um, because a lot of the complaints we're getting, you know, on on pavements are about you know, trip hazards all the time. So I think you know, it, that's that that's the advantage. But I do recognise, like you do, that if that, um, in conservation areas, then people will have strong um, views about you know, um, what uh, like for like replacement, which they do raise you know, um, a lot in 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 Bourneville in particular. So thanks very much for clarifying that. Okay, then the last question on on this item then from Eddie, yeah, Councillor Freeman. Just a quick end, Chair. I mean, as, as you know, we're, we're all on the walkabouts around our wards. Uh, we can get emergency done between uh, eight o'clock and uh, eight o'clock on the, the morning and uh, through the night. But we, during the day when we're walking around, we have to go all through the rigmarole of going to our computers or whatever. But I've always said this a lot with housing. Can the councillors have a hotline number so we, when we are walking around and we spot a, a dangerous hazard, either, a, you know, an ant column with the door hanging off or a, or a trip hazard, we can phone them straight away. Instead of going through our engineers or going through our computer, where we can get them out within the hour, sorting it out instead of when we finish our business, go home and then put it all on a computer or wait until eight o'clock at night or six o'clock, I should say, until uh, to get somebody out. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Eddie. Uh, Quick response on that, Kevin. I think to be fair to me on this occasion, I'm not usually fair to me, um, but th that might be a different discussion for a different scrutiny. Um, I know the cust customer services side. Service. Of the, uh, yeah, customer services side of thing, though, in terms of where those get get reported into, is obviously something that um, that yeah, obviously there's a bigger discussion going on about how how as a council we. We, we get, and as you say, Councillor Freeman, whether it's about housing, whether it's about highways, whatever it is, about how those get efficiently and effectively reported into the into the council. Um, as far as I know, there, there's nothing in in the discussions that are ongoing through. And again, I know I know others have been at other scrutiny committees this week on on last week on 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 perhaps looking how that that the customer services system works. But um, as far as I know, there's no plan at the moment for a hotline as such. Uh, but there is always the, um, as I said, the, um, uh, I think it's still the double six double four number that exists for for phoning in any queries. It's not a hotline, but it it is a direct line into the in, into the customer services team. Um, I'm not sure Thomas had his hand up. I'm not sure if he's got anything he wants to add to that. But it's it's 
probably not something we can really add to as a highway service. It's probably more more of a customer services one. Yes, uh, so, so chair, if I can just say, it, it's I think Kevin just covered that bit that we do have. Well, it's not like a hot hotline, but it is a number that we, you could call the double th the three zero three double six double four. And as, as long as you, you, you call that number, your query will be, will, will be addressed, and and uh, somebody will 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 get get in touch to investigate it as soon as they can. Thanks very much, Thomas. Yeah, I mean, Eddie, I'm as you know that the coordinating overview and scrutiny have done a big piece of work on customer customer service. I can feed that back now through the through through co-org committee. Um, I mean, I personally find the um, the Kia Highway Steward is really extremely responsiveness. If I see anything that looks urgent, um, uh, I tend to contact him. Obviously, if it's that if it's in working hours, but you know, I do understand the the, the issue you're raising. Okay, then, in view of the time, I'd like to draw this this section of the agenda to a close and um, thank Kevin and um, Thomas and Kami Afni for a very comprehensive um, presentation and lots of good news, you know, for, um, from this report and about the the. Um, the, the, the funding award for the Tame Valley Viaduct. So um, can you just tell us what time that um, news broadcast will be on? Uh, I'll probably hand over to Camio because he's, he's the one that's got his face on the telly. So Camio, do you know what time is it going to be central news tonight? I understand it's at seven o'clock. Sorry. It's ITV. I beg your pardon, it's at six o'clock. It's already been on uh, the dinner time news, by the way. On ITV. It was it's on the news at Twitter. All right. Excellent. Well, we can all um, look out for that, and maybe we can get um, actually maybe Bassi, we could send round a um, a link if it's on if we can get it in some way and catch up. But thanks very much. And yes, um, Kevin, uh, you'll be back in January, so we'll see you again. But um, no um, Thomas and Cammy, have a you know thanks very much, and uh, yes, have a good Christmas and New Year, and um, sure we'll see you again um, too. Okay. Merry Christmas. Thanks. Yeah. Merry Christmas to Merry all. Merry Christmas. Bye. Thank so you. we'll move on now to the report um, on the review of the um, school street project and um, Peter Edwards is here to present this um, for us. So over to you, Peter. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'll um, just share my screen in order to bring up the presentation. I hope everybody can see that. Um, so my name is Peter Edwards, Travel Demand Manager and Transport and Connectivity. Um, so a year, just over a year ago, my predecessor, uh, Joe Green, brought a, brought an update to, to this committee. Um, so I've come back a year later with a further update to tell you where we are with phase one and phase two and uh, a further phase and, and the kind of plans for the Car Free, streets, um, Car Free School Streets programme. Um, so some of these slides haven't changed because obviously a school street hasn't changed. I think most people on the call will, will understand what uh, a school street is. So where we're putting children and families first, really trying to encourage walking, scooting and cycling and obviously trying to keep people safe and healthy. So there's a kind of transport mode, but also safety uh, is built into within this. Joe would have touched upon this last year in terms of car free school streets is, is just one element of our kind of toolkit when it comes to engaging with schools. We have a lot of other kind of uh, programs that we run with schools in terms of getting people to slow down, park considerately outside the school, not idle, et cetera, et cetera, outside the school. So the, so the car free school streets that we're going to look at in more detail is just one of a, of a number of elements that we have at our disposal. So Car Free School Street is a school, uh, is a street, sorry, where we shut the street um, at pick up and drop off times. That's determined by the school, um, except for people with uh, uh, an exemption or a residence permit. Um, so six schools were in the initial pilot phase one, September 2019. Just after Joe came to this committee in October, we'd, we'd put in phase two. So that's six schools in September 20. Uh, no further schools were implemented in, sep in September 21 due to the pressures on schools kind of reopening from COVID. Um, but we now have six schools on board for phase three that we're looking to deliver kind of after the February half term into March. Um, so we're, we will be up to, in three months time, up to 18 schools uh, across the city. Um, 
we have a selection process. This isn't appropriate for all locations. Um, so schools come to us. Um, we advertise through our, our existing channels. We have counsellors, etc., parents who contact us and ask if it would be appropriate. Um, it's delivered on an ETRO, so an experimental traffic order, uh, which gives us 18 months. And the advantage of doing that um, is that if the school wants to change the timings, then that can be done at the point of making the TRO permanent and it enables things to be switched around during that 18 month trial period. And we want the schools to kind of own this. We do all the we do all the legwork and we do all the the administrative work. But once it's kind of delivered, we expect the school to kind of own it and to and to take it over. So this 18 month period, if it's not working, um, then it could could be taken out after that 18 month period. Thankfully, that hasn't happened as yet with, with any of the 12 schools that we've put in. It's funded via the Transport and Highways Capital Programme. So there's an allocation in that programme for this annually in order to um, in order to, to, to pay for this. So it's signs and the TRO process, et cetera. We also provide the schools with kind of materials, barriers, et cetera, if they want to, if they want to marshal the schools, uh, the street closures. And we also obviously distribute permits for local residents, et cetera, and people with blue badges, ambulances, et cetera, obviously are automatically exempt. They don't need a permit. Um, so phase two, so phase two has been evaluated. Um, and it's, I'm pleased to report that there is, there's a po very positive feedback from, from the schools. Uh, four of the six schools, we've had vet, like enough feedback to, to move forward in terms of making the, the process, uh, the TRO permanent. Two of them, we haven't had much response back from parents or residents. So we've reopened the, the consultation link, link on Be Heard to, and asked the schools to kind of push that forward more. But the school is happy. Um, and we're kind of taking the angle that if people haven't contacted us to to say that they're very unhappy about the scheme and have simply not replied, then we don't. We think we will likely to be making these um, all six of the phase two schools permanent. So that process will be completed uh, in the next few months. We have all the data of the evaluation and a colleague in my team is writing up the report at the moment so we can share that in the new year uh, with with the committee with, with councillor clements once that's all been finished um, and there's some potential mitigation measures um, being proposed to some of the schools um, which is also part of the package so if if there is if the implementation of a car free school street then leads to an issue on a neighboring street or some in considerate parking on verges, etc., then we have money within the budget to try and to try and mitigate those those issues. Uh, so just some stats in terms of um, what people have said on the phase two schools. Um, so you can see some positive numbers. Um, Seventy three percent saying around the school is safer and a more pleasant environment. Um, perhaps the most important: Do you think car free school streets should continue? Seventy six percent. And do you think other schools in Birmingham would benefit around about the same sort of number? So it's a very positive feedback. Most of this feedback is from parents and residents. Uh, but the schools are obviously um, po uh, positive too, because we wouldn't take it forward if they did not want to take it forward. This is taken from our modal, sh uh, sorry, from our uh, Mode Shift Stars program and just shows a positive uh, modal shift at Cofton Primary. This is one of our phase one schools. So you can see uh, previous to the scheme going in, 35% uh, of people driving their kids to school and that has been replaced mostly by park and stride. So people parking further away and then walking, but also a small increase in walking. Um, so quite a positive result. That's a phase one school. Thought it was important to include some kind of quotes from parents. Uh, I won't read them all out. You can see them. You, you, you've got the uh, you've got the notes um, in the, with the agenda. Um, so yeah, people commenting on the kind of people's inconsiderate parking, idling cars, etc., making the um, making the, the area outside the school far safer. But it's not always entirely perfect i think it's always important to acknowledge that fact we have um seen some displacement at some locations to neighboring streets and 
just last week uh, received a kind of draft report from Sustrans who had been commissioned to do a piece of work by the Road Safety Trust. So at two of our uh, phase two schools, uh, Hillstone and Somerville, they installed cameras um, at, at those schools over three periods of so September, March and May, June, I think it was, um, to, to assess the displacement um, and to do it in a kind of scientific and method, um, scientific research driven way. They've sent a draft, as I say, to, to us and we've had a little look through that and I'm pleased to report, and again, we can share this in the new year when it's been finalised, that um, their findings at those two schools, it's important to say this isn't, they haven't done every single school, is that yes, there is some displacement, but the interactions they've seen um, on those cameras and from kind of having people on the ground is that there is some displacement still there is some parking near to the school street closures but they haven't witnessed that potentially resulting in in poor road safety and then the perception uh, the perceptions amongst people that they've interviewed residents etc are still very positive about the scheme but it's not to say that it's always perfect and always in every location and uh, that's a quote there um, from from a phase two school and that that school we're looking at how we can how we can potentially mitigate the issues that, that they're describing there of course what we want is for people to to change their behavior to to walk cycle scoot their kids to school but we know that a lot of parents will still drive may still need to drive to where where that's the case we're trying to advertise um park and stride where they can walk park further away near nearby park or pub etc and then walk the last half a mile um and there's and that, that's where my officers in my team come in and that's where they're working with the schools in terms of their travel plans and trying to help them and trying to identify those locations um enforcement so at the most it's done by signage uh, and we ask for support from local PCSOs and from local police. Um, that often is done more at the start of the scheme um, and then and then kind of tails off a little bit. Obviously, the police have very limited resources, so there's not always going to be a police officer standing there. Um, as you can see from some of the quotes, sometimes that leads to, to poor behaviour creeping back in. Um, we don't have the power to use CCTV like this parent has suggested. Uh, that's something that we don't have the power to do to use AMPR like, like they do in London. And that would obviously also have a financial implication. Um, but we work with the schools to, to try and help to, to try and with get police support, but also the, there is an expectation of them to marshal the, marshal the closures. And again, that the school don't have infinite resources, that's relying on their staff. And as the slide says, this hasn't, some schools continue to do this. Some schools did it for the first few months and have tailed off um, and then do it at certain times. Um, so we want them to marshal it, but we can't force them to marshal it. As I said, it's their scheme. We want them to, to, to kind of take control of it. Already said, I think it kind of goes without saying, and Joe would have touched upon this last year, that um, not every, not all locations can be considered uh, if you've got a bus route, a busy A road, B road, etc. Um, but we are doing roads that aren't cul-de-sacs. We are starting to challenge slightly more challenging locations, um, but I think we have to manage at some schools' expectations on what we can and can't do um, in their locations. Um, so that brings us to the end, really, in terms of what are our next steps. So we ha will have the Sustrans report on um, displacement to share um, in the new year. They're just finalising that. I've sent them comments in the last couple of weeks. We're we'll looking to make the TROs uh, permanent at some of the, uh, the all, hopefully at all six of the phase two schools uh, and looking at any potential mitigation measures that need to be put in uh, for phase three. We'll be putting those in in February, March, so I'm taking that through the governance process at the moment. Um, and we've completed all the consultation with residents and schools, and then we'll have to get um, permits, etc., out in the new year. I think that. Oh, yeah. And then finally, it's just because I think a uh, brief I was given was just in terms of how does this become kind of a rolling program from my perspective? We are out of a pilot. I'm not thinking of this as a like it is a rolling program now. We have um, we have a budget in place. I already have more schools that are have approached us, councillors that have approached us for schools in their wards. So once we've delivered um, 
the 6th in February, March, we will then begin to look at the next the next batch for probably for, for the September. You want to do this in kind of half terms or terms to enable the science to go in and to, to get, get all that communication out. Obviously, that's constrained by by some budget, but also by capacity in the TRO team and by in, in my own team in terms of um, the work that goes in. There's a lot of engagement work around this uh, and governance. But from my perspective, having having taken over from, from Joe in the last few months, that this is now part of our toolkit and will be part of our kind of ongoing um, offer to schools. Um, but we also really need to just really focus on the behaviour change. Um, we've talked about uh, in the in the Birmingham Transport Plan that 25% of um, journeys by car in this city are less than one mile, and these are the journeys we've got to tackle. So, where we have um, schools on main roads and bus routes where maybe a, a car-free school street doesn't work, there are other things we can do. We can improve uh, the built environment around the school, and we can work with them from a travel planning perspective in terms of trying to trying to get shift them uh, onto other other uh, other modes of transport, other more sustainable modes of transport. Um, and there's just some photos from I think from from the phase one schools to to finish really. Um, have a website uh, and obviously our team mailbox if uh, people are approached by parents schools that's where people need to come and, and to, to speak to my team to to ask for ask for more information or to put forward schools um, for car free school streets so i'll stop presenting Great. Thanks very much, Peter. I thought that you know, very, um, very um, encouraging presentation, and good to hear that you know, that this is moving towards becoming really, you know, um, um, a mainstream um, intervention that we make outside schools. I've got one in my ward. It's been very successful. There are some issues with displacement, so I was glad to hear that you know that that some research has been done on that. Um, but you know, overall, you no, know, really, really positive development. Um, um, Mike Leddy, um, you've been waiting for a long time patiently, so please ask your question. Uh, it, it's not a question, Chair. Uh, it's to commend uh, Mr Edwards and his team uh, for the work that they've done in, in making uh, these car-free streets for schools. Like you, Chair, uh, I've got one in my ward, and I don't think there is a councillor that doesn't get uh, correspondence, emails or advice centre cases uh, where parents are, com are not complaining. Uh, about parking around schools. It's uh, a thing of the times. Uh, but uh, I do commend uh, these car-free streets. And now that you've said that uh, you're looking at other uh, schools uh, w which are on roads and, and not just cul-de-sacs, uh, no doubt uh, many of us will be coming knocking on your door uh, with parents once again. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. I think you've very well deserved praise there, but I don't know if you want to respond to that in any way, Peter. No, this is, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that praise. And yeah, I think I think we can all agree it's a bit like it's a bit like the clean air zone, which is where I, which is where I used to work is kind of everybody wants to breathe cleaner, cleaner air and agrees that it should be cleaner. And especially outside schools, it's just a, the approach of how we get there uh, and, and, and how we implement it without impacting on other school, uh, other roads and other residents. So I know the school in your ward, Councillor uh, Clements, we've now introduced a further TRO on a, on a neighbouring road. Um, but then there's another neighbouring road that's requesting that we we potentially do it for them as well. So there are ways and means of us mitigating these measures, but we just need to really focus and hone in on these this behaviour change. Um, but yes, we have hit a lot of the easy targets in terms of cul-de-sacs, um, but three or, three or four of the schools that we are doing in phase three are what we would call like two-point entries, so not so straightforward. But the need is there. The school is the school is keen, um, and and we're gonna gonna push ahead with it. But there are no easy answers for for a school on a main road, which is obviously um, more likely to be a secondary school, etc. But we are working and engaging with those schools as well. Thanks, Peter. And I've certainly the, um, found you know, the support from Mandy Slater and the Mode Shift Stars team. That that's absolutely crucial, isn't it? And and. So I think we try to engage all the schools um, in our in in my ward with with Mandy, you know, and that they, they, those sort of activities because we've got a couple of you know, um, 
tricky locations where you know, if the school is by a bus route, you know, and there are some constraints there. But I picked up from the presentation that, you know, that you're you know, thinking about um, you know, ways around that and other interventions. So it'd be good to hear more about that um, in the future. Um, Tim, Councillor Huxtable, over to you. You're a bit faint. Can you hear me? You were slightly faint at the beginning, but you're okay now. Right. Okay, that's good. Well, um, f first of all, Peter will be glad to know I won't be um, banging on his door because we've done a hundred percent of the schools in my own ward, i.e., the one and only. Um, but it's a broader point, and if we now we've done the school street project it's linking it up to a broader wider safer routes to school scheme because if we're going to now say you know we want the mode to to shift because we've made it difficult um, for car parking in the immediate vicinity of the school it's getting those safe routes to encourage that modal shift uh, uh, across busy roads and uh, that is something I think that needs to be looked at through the um, highways um, capital plan, because if the money for the school streets comes from that and the money from the safer routes to school scheme comes from that, why don't we look at linking the two together because they're coming from the same pot of money and, and taking a, a more holistic approach. And my second comment is in the same vein, We've talked about air quality. Peter has talked about air quality monitoring kits being given to the schools. Can we incorporate a no idling in the in the vicinity? Um, so um, so we actually improve air quality around the schools as part of these schemes. And going back to the the first ones of this rolling program and looking at sort of incorporating these no idling zones. Uh, at, at, you know, retrospectively, but in future schemes included at the same time. Thank you, Chair. OK, I can see, think, um, Eddie, have you got a question as well? If, we, if you ask your question, then we'll get Peter to come back on both both sets of questions from, from um, Councillor Huxtable and you. OK, thank you, Chair. But, you know, when we outside schools with these keep clear zigzags and also in some schools there's time timelines or double yellow lines but i found out one of the hardest ways some of these uh, enforcement only goes as far as the curb people are finding their way as you know bumping up the, the pavements and parking on the pavements where the enforcement doesn't come into or grass verges i'm wondering if you can do when you do that side of the schools is to extend the enforcement bound, boundary from the curb to the outer boundary where we obviously the land we own up to the end of the pavements buy a property or the grass verge uh, and then when we do enforce forces or the police enforces it sends a message to everybody they can't just bump over the double yellow lines to park on the pavement or the or the grass verge you know that, that's that, another thing could come into the cost you know because as I say a lot of people they know the rules of the road and they know where they can park where they can't park I mean I see to quite regularly up at uh, Kings Norton up Kings Norton Green there by the school there where they're all parking up on the pavements because they're jumping the yellow lines or parking actually virtually on in, in the bus stop shelter, you know, just to get, a, get away. And the enforcement officers can't do much about it. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Freeman. So, Peter, if you could come back on the on the, the, those um, points raised by um, Councillor Huxtable and Councillor Freeman. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, on the enforcement front, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. Um, um, where where we have infringements on double yellow lines etc can be done by our own enforcement teams where people are parking and and, and blocking the pavement uh, that is kind of uh, a police a police matter and that's where the kind of the, the gray area is um over a year ago the government consulted on um pavement parking and giving local authorities the power to to enforce on that and they haven't in fact just before I was on this call, I got some kind of industry newsletter thing calling on the government to kind of respond to that because they've done the consultation, but they've never taken any action as yet. So until we are given the, the powers 
in a kind of civil enforcement to to enforce on the pavement it's a police matter and obviously as we talk, talked about in the presentation the police are, are stretched and, and don't have the resources they help where they can um but until we have that um or if we get that there's not a huge amount we can do without police support um but i'm hopeful that given the kind of the, the public feeling about this, I think it's in, in the national media a lot uh, about pavement parking, the impact it has, um, that hopefully we'll be given those powers um, and hopefully that will help with the enforcement. Um, going back to Councillor Huxtable's point about kind of connecting car free school streets and safer routes to school, they are they are connected. So for example, in uh, Councillor Leddy's ward, we have Colmore School, uh, quite close to uh, Camp Hill School. The Camp Hill School is the kind of notoriously uh, some of the parents there are causing issues that then impact on the on the Colmore School in terms of the people walking their children to school, inconsiderate parking, idling engines. Not outside Colmore, outside the school, but a lot of the parents are walking past there. Um, we're having lots of complaints about that. So the safer routes to school, which is also managed by a member of my team, uh, is 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 trying to negate that as well so we're putting in some kind of what we call signs and lines and some smaller measures <clears throat> excuse me around uh the camp hill the, the 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 school to try and alleviate some of the pressures on 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 the primary school that we're that we're also going to look at a car free school street so they are aligned they're from the same budget that they're, they're kind of managed by the same team so jill who jill in my team is doing it used to be called Safe Routes to School. Now it's just called School Streets. So we have school streets and car-free school streets. Um, but it is managed all by my team in collaboration with the, the local engineers um, and is linked together. So Mandy will say, we're going to do a car-free school street. And then Jill and my team will say, well, we're looking at this for a, for a, for a Safer Routes to School measure. Um, on the air quality and the idling, as I said in the presentation, so we have our kind of uh, anti-idling kits. I know outside my daughter's primary school, there's a big banner which I use to kind of point, at par point parents to when I'm politely tapping on their windows and asking them to turn their engines off outside the school. So we so we help the school in that regard, but I should have also meant to touch on this um, in my presentation. There is also a project underway with colleagues from from environmental health and Mark Wollstonecroft's team um, to procure a network of um, air quality monitoring devices to be applied to schools. Um, my colleague Mandy has been has been supporting that, and we've got thirty schools signed up already. So they will get an air quality monitor out in inserted at their school. But we also want to use this as an educational tool. Um, so it will have kind of an LED display on it, and we're also during the procurement process asking that this has kind of educational resources linked to it. So can we have a website or games and build it into the curriculum so it's not just planted on the school wall? It's useful for us, obviously, to have the data, but we want to then use it as an engagement tool with the with the kids and with the parents. Um, so that project's underway. It's out to procurement at the moment. Um, so, yeah, in terms of the air quality, we're absolutely looking at that and trying to get one of those in every ward um, in the city. So 30, as I say, signed up so far, but I think there's budget for more than for more than 50 of those um so that's just a so um, in terms of engagement and and getting those schools on board um but it's been a really positive response so far great tim do you want to come back i can see your hands raised again uh, that's a legacy hand chair okay that's fine then well that's yes what you just told us then peter about that that um project that's new um, emerging with schools that, that's really exciting because again I get lots of requests from parents to know about new specific data about the air quality outside the school so you know really welcome that okay if there are no more questions and I'd like to thank Peter and everyone who's working in his team you know, for the amazing work that they've done on on um, car free school streets and now school streets in general because I think you know, it's um you know, it's starting to really you know um push forward this you know, um uh mode shift you know and you know we need to, you know, to take it further but um very well done and yes we'll look forward to seeing the, the next um set of schools being rolled out thank you very much thank you yeah and i'll share the the, the evaluation of phase two and the sustrans report that i referred to with councillors afra and and through the through the, the the member kind of networks as well in the new year thank you i think we'll be all be very interested to see that particularly the one on, on displacement but yes thanks very much okay thank you okay so the next and final item on our agenda is um, um, uh, a report and briefing from from Sylvia on the um, council um, 
electric vehicle charging strategy, which went through cabinet um, um, recently. Um, again, a key issue um, in the transport transformation plan. So over to you, Sylvia, and thanks for waiting patiently for, for, the, for the, um, the, the first two items. <coughs> That's, that's no no problem. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Sylvia Broadley here, Specialist Energy Manager under Planning and Regeneration Inclusive Growth. Um, I have got a presentation, um, but I'm joining by my phone and um, Basima was going to be um, sorting the the presentation out. Is Basima there? Yeah, I'm just doing that. OK, thanks. Yeah, because I think the presentation was emailed round to members. But yes, if we can, if we can share it, if you if you're able to share it, Basima, that would be yeah. helpful. Yeah. Thank Thank you very much. Yes, and I'm sorry I haven't got my camera on. I I am sort of restricted by my connectivity here. So, uh, um, it, it's I'm just connected by audio. Don't worry, I I empathise because I've had I'm having continuing broadband problems, which are not resolved, even though I've had. BT out actually yeah. in my house trying to sort them out so um I yeah, am desympathized. So um but maybe if I just kick off while the the um the presentation's been sorted particularly if you've already had it uh, circulated so just the wider context of the the strategy uh, as as you'll know is um about the commitment to reducing the, the city's emissions so that's NO2 in terms of air quality but also carbon as well um, and this uh, aligns with the recent um, commitment that the council have ma has made to a net zero uh, carbon by the early 2030s, but also the recognition that um, at least a third of uh, Birmingham's CO2 emissions actually come from transport. Obviously, there, there is a high level of NO2 as well, um, and that. I think accounts for, uh, by memory, for uh, around 80% of uh, transport emissions. Um, and so if we can move to slide two, that'd be great. That's what I'm on now. That's it. Um, and just the recognition also that there are over 11 million vehicle miles travelled per day in Birmingham, which the vast majority are actually by car. And this aligns with the previous uh, presentation, particularly uh, around 25% are, are less than, than a mile. Um, so in looking at decarbonisation of transport, it not only requires a switch actually to electric cars and vans, and it's not just that zero emission is electric, it's hydrogen, and I'm sure there'd be other um, technologies like liquefied air and whatever that would be coming in, in future years, but the years. But you know, the focus here is is actually on the, the electric cars and that switch to electric, but in, in, in the near future will be to hydrogen as well. But it is absolutely dependent on a significant modal shift away from uh, private vehicle use to public transport. And um, in line with the Birmingham Transport Plan, um, this is where, you know, one can see that the major capital infrastructure developments on the reallocation of road space um, on, on the, the city's uh, major roads, the prioritisation of bus lanes, um, the, the um, continued development of the metro and the introduction of Sprint. There's many, many um, big capital developments all going towards. And in looking at this um, EV strategy, it aligns with that Birmingham transport plan. And uh, when we've looked at the modelling of actually where can you start to make uh, impact, that modal shift needs to be at at least 40% to start to make a significant difference. And so this EV strategy is aligned actually with that need for modal shift at that that level and therefore from that in modeling what does this look like in terms of the rollout of EV infrastructure that's what the the, the strategy is is uh, working around um, so in looking at the uptake of electric vehicles it's actually about having a comprehensive public EV charging network across Burma across the city not just the city centre it's right across uh, the, the city. And 
particularly starting to look at where um, transition needs to happen as as early as as possible. Um, And that is, you know, with particular fleets like your taxi fleet, your hackney carriages and private hire vehicles, uh, looking at how we can um, increase the take up of car clubs, um, how we can work with um, commercial fleets and and that transition and just by way of note if, if, in looking at um, where the manufacturing of electric vehicles are in the main that is around cars and vans in looking at your much bigger vehicles your HGVs um, that that is you know more in line with 2025 and 2030 so where we are at the moment with strategy is actually looking at this initial um, Phase and that that development, but the strategy will work in line to uh, major developments, you know, towards 25, 2025 to 2030 uh, as well. And obviously, a key priority area those residents um, who have limited or no off street uh, parking where there there is a take up there. Um, the the strategy, but also the the key contractual development. Uh, is a partnership with ESB Energy and the, our phase one element of the strategy is the initial 394 fast and rapid charge points by the end of uh, next year um, as the first part of the strategy on which we will build um, to 2032 in achieving the, the objectives of the strategy. So the key um, elements of the strategy um, focuses on how much EV infrastructure will be? Oh, sorry, my sorry, my presentation just disappeared. Uh, how much EV um, infrastructure will be needed by 2030, 2032? Uh, where should this infrastructure be deployed, and what the time frame um, the, the the infrastructure should be deployed over? So, in looking at the the next uh, slide. Um, the key focus of the strategy um, is, is looking at the deployment of fast and rapid charge hubs um, supported where necessary by innovative uh, on-street uh, solutions as well. And a key part of that is about delivering a charge and go model. It's about, as I've mentioned, ensuring a citywide coverage, but also backing that up with communication and public consultation as well. So in looking at, as a starter for 10, on what those charger types actually are and what those speeds are, uh, we're particularly within the strategy looking at the residential en route and destination charging. Now, they they require different types of uh, chargers. So from your residential, particularly in those areas where there is low or no off-street parking, um, it's actually looking at rapid hub development. So a bit like your petrol and diesel uh, stations at the moment, you know, that's where you go and you fill up. But with your your rapid hub, that's actually about charging within 20, 30 minutes. Um, and so that's where your 50 kilowatt plus type charge points uh, will be located. We are looking also at on street um, as well uh, within those areas on route. And this is your key network, um, your highway where the the, uh, charge points are distributed and that's aligned with uh, traffic flow um, information, the proximity also to uh, amenities as well. But also clearly in all of these scenarios, it's critical in terms of the access to the Western Power Distribution, WPD, their power, their their network, the grid connectivity um, issues as well. Uh, And the last element are your destination uh, type uh, charge points as well. So that that would be typically be your your supermarkets, your retail outlets, um, your parks, um, you know, those those destination type of um, uh, uh, scenarios there. And so from your your rapid, which is 50 kilowatts plus, and that would enable a charge within 20, 30 minutes, but that is dependent on the vehicle, 
through to what we're calling slow, uh, slow too fast. So fast is 22 kilowatts. Slow is below ten, uh, below seven kilowatts. So the first phase of the strategy is fast and rapid. That's 22 kilowatts, which will charge within two hours and 50 kilowatts within 20, 30 minutes. Um, your slow is tends to be anything from four to eight hours. And typically that is your overnight type of uh, charging uh, scenario. So, Sylvia, um, sorry, Sylvia yeah. just sorry to, to interrupt your yeah. flow. Um, it's very interesting. I've just yeah. picked up a comment, a question in the chat from Councillor Johnson White. He's asking um, about um, do pe drivers have to pay to use the ch charging points? What's the what's the system then for paying? Yes, but yes it is. Um, with procuring a, a charge point um, delivery partner, yes, at the, at the minute it is free, but from next year, we'll have to pay for the electric that's actually been uh, used. So on the, the highway, that would be um, charging and just paying for the electric. If you're actually charging within a public car park, you are paying the parking a fee as well. If for a rapid, that's that's only up to one hour. Uh, that you're paying but if you're staying there for four to eight hours you're having to pay the um whatever the parking charge is so the cost of the the electric will be um competitive with um you know other charge point providers um and by having this type of arrangement what we actually get is um the back end 24 7 customer support there are performance indicators at 99.9% um, of uh, uptime of those, those uh, charge points and also performance indicators for response to uh, charge points where um, whether they're vandalised or whether there is, there is a problem actually with them and they, they, they need to be fixed. So it's going down a commercial route to make this feasible and viable to ensure not only the, the range um, of network delivery, but actually also that that back end support, that back end communication as well. Does, does that answer the question? Yes, I think so. If you, could, I'm sure Julie yes, can you. follow up with yeah. um, any sure. supplementaries. Yeah, at the end. Yeah, do right. carry on. Okay. So, and, and as mentioned, uh, the the vehicle sc scope. Um, are your um, passenger vehicles, small vans, motorcycles, and also uh, the taxi uh, community, both hack and carriage and uh, private hire. Um, just moving towards uh, the, that last element about communication and public consultation, we have launched um, on Be Heard the, the survey, uh, which is opening up to uh, local resident citizens about the barriers that they face. And this is particularly aimed at uh, those who live in those areas without um, off-street parking. Because in order for us to uh, look at solutions, we have to do that at scale. Um, and we're collecting that data from postcodes that people will be putting forward that where they particularly um, have problems and look at in those particular areas what those solutions actually are. Some of that will actually be um, addressed by developing those uh, rapid and fast charging hubs in local areas and that's what we're trying to get to in in, in every area in Birmingham that um, communities are in proximity to fast and rapid um, and these will be uh, close to amenity so it would coincide with whether you're you're going shopping or going for coffee or, or whatever that you can be charging your vehicles up at, at uh, the same time um, also uh, we now have the .gov uh, website page, which has got much more information, newsletters, FAQs. There's access to the strategy um, as well, as well as the link to the Be Heard survey um, and also um, the maps and where we're adding where all the latest charge points are actually going to be um, installed. Um, and also we've put in there from the private sector point of view, ZAP map, which actually shows all charge points so that that is the private sector coming in particularly where we're seeing a rapid growth of uh, supermarkets putting in uh, charge points and other places of destination so it's about bringing all that information together 
um, to, to give more of a comprehensive view. So just Sylvia, move to, um, yeah. Councillor Huxtable is indicating something. You may have a quick question. Right, OK. Sorry, I can't see it. I, all no, I that's, that's fine. Yes, Tim, right. do you want to, it's something yeah. you want to ask now? Yeah. Uh, no, I'll ask at the end. Thank you, Chair. No, you can ask at the end. OK, sorry, I, I was being a bit previous there. Apologies, both of you. <laughs> sorry. OK, um, so just moving on to the next slide. Uh, this provides uh, the roadmap for delivery. And it, from the point I mentioned at the outset about aligning with modal shift um, and getting you know, that shift by cutting uh, road private uh, car use, you know, by 40 percent in, in actually looking at that timeline um, where we kicked off in 2020, but going up to 2030, 2032, it starts to give an indication of the modelling of where figures are um, in terms of take up of electric vehicles. Um, but bearing in mind, people will also be choosing to uh, be walking, cycling, uh, to be using public transport, to using um, other means such as the, the uh, car club type of uh, uh, provision as well. Um, I think it's also useful to note that as things stand at the moment, EV take up UK wide is actually less than 5%. So it has started, there is growth, um, and it's about matching the development of infrastructure actually around uh, that that uh, that growth and where the modelling, which is based on DFT uh, data, uh, transport for West Midlands and our own traffic flow uh, data as well, the, the modelling actually indicates that what we'll be looking at by 2030, 2032, if through the Birmingham Transport Plan, we have achieved the modal shift um, that we um, are anticipating, then that um, shows that that the approximate number of charge points required would be around about 3,600, of which around about 580 to 600 would be the, the rapid charges. Um, and this will be that scenario of uh, hub type development, on street type development, and then strategic places of destination as well and there's a lot of work in the background um, uh, working with Transport for West Midlands in terms of their park and ride sites, working with our own parks, um, a, a lot of which are actually in local communities um, and in working with retail outlets like you know, shopping uh, centre um, actually about making sure that that provision is there as well as within you know more local community uh, settings. And what you can see from there um, is from the, the timeline of the citywide strategy, what we are looking at in terms of the fast and rapid charging. You can see where we are at the moment is, is delivering on the 394 uh, as the phase one. And really, this is the backbone on which we're, we're, we're building on. But going on right through to 2030 is, is uh, continuing to keep developing um, on the, those highways and public spaces and the uh, alignment with um, the private sector developers as well. Um, with on-street charging, there, particularly in those areas, those residential areas with, with no off-street parking, we, we have been working across a number of developments of which um, Trojan through the STEP project is, is one of them, and that's actually uh, trialling um, and uh, looking at the evaluation of inset curb charge points where actually the technology is inset within the within the curbstone and the user actually has um it's it's like a, a um a stake that that's put into that inset of of the curbstone which is linked to the the charger in in their their vehicle so you can actually have a number of charge points actually without having to be the pillars um, I think a thing to note in terms of those alternative, more innovative charge point solutions, they are not fast or rapid. They tend to be very low level. They're three kilowatt, five kilowatt uh, type of um, charging. And those are typically overnights, what they call trickle charging. Is that, that's the overnight. Um, the key thing about 
charge uh, the charging infrastructure is if you are opening up to public accessibility it's about opening up reach and accessibility as long as you've got low level charging you've only ever got one person using it and by going down the fast and rapid route what you're looking at is enabling many people to benefit from that that charge point um, infrastructure so that's why that is the backbone actually of the strategy it doesn't take away or negate the use of much lower level uh, type of charging that that will be um, applied in those areas where really there there is no alternative um, possible in that particular area to to have fast and uh, rapid and also typically that will be in areas where the grid connectivity is is either completely fragmented or just not available um, or there's just not enough connectivity um, to to enable uh, charge points, you know, fast and rapid to to be available. Um, there there is a whole raft of uh, support activities, as as mentioned, in in terms of uh, working with the private sector um, to make sure that there is the 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 spread there, uh, you know, within retail outlets and other places of destination, aligned with what it is that that we're actually doing. So we're ensuring that there's not over provision. We're making sure that there is sufficient provision. Um, actually there and also the monitoring activities of actually where the market is going. Um, we have been looking at other cities uh, in Nottingham and Oxford and in, in London and where that particularly where their starting points were, where there were a lot of charge points being put out, but they tended to be a lot of the low level trickle charge where actually the use of that, uh, the, the use of those was was not taken up. Um, particularly well or not at the levels that they um, actually anticipated um, and also we're, we're looking at the alignment with where the markets of where vehicles um, within the market is is um, actually going the DFT numbers um, which indicate EV take up uh, within the city and across the UK and what proportion that is against um, other new car sales um, and other vehicles registered within uh, the, the city as well. Um, also, we will be, in relation to the BHUD survey, we will be tracking and logging uh, residents' requests. So what we're not doing as a strategy is saying, you know, resident in number three, you know, whatever road, or, you know, Archaeus Road, uh, we're putting a charge point right outside your house um, because this is about public accessibility. This is about ensuring everybody has access. So even if a charge point is outside somebody's house, anybody can actually use it. There's no guarantee for that person who lives in that house that they can actually get to use um, that. Uh, there have been quite a number of uh, requests um, for charge points outside people's houses and, you know, that they would pay for it or can we put a gully from their electric supply through to the, the edge of the pavement? Um, although some of those things have been tried out elsewhere, it, it is actually really difficult. Having um, gullies, you know, you suddenly get into the PFI arrangements for uh, maintenance and costs there are liabilities, insurance, and all, all the rest of it. And because it's on the public highway, actually there's no guarantee that that person can still use that um, you know, particular charge point. So it, it is a very difficult um, area. And where the, the, the strategy is trying to get to is about how do we ensure the widest possible access and what we see from particularly from experience from, from other cities who, that, that are now also going down this route of fast and rapid, whether that's in a hub situation, whether that is, um, you know, on the highway or in, in, in other scenarios, that that is the, the, the route that um, other cities are actually going. And that's how we have formed uh, the, the strategy here. So moving to uh, the next slide. Where we started from, we, we've prioritised the areas of high projected demand um, that would be prioritised for deployment. So 
in 2021, this is where we actually see the, the prioritisation and it's on your key routes, particularly. Uh, they are strategic sites. They align with uh, some of those key groups um, that, that were the starter for 10. So it's your, your taxi. So it's not only taxi ranks, it's actually looking at where at the postcodes where taxi drivers are actually uh, living as well. But also it's that, that general approach of you know, where the amenities are actually for destination charging. You know, because if you're going to go in charge and you're going to leave your vehicle, for whether it's half an hour or for two hours, Actually, you want to be doing something, uh, whether that's shopping or, you know, um, you know, recreation activities or, or whatever. Um, we are looking at um, the, those residential areas as well, where th that we do know are um, areas that, that do not have um, uh, on street uh, to, sorry, have a reliance on on street parking, but also particularly. The key thing here is actually where the majority of the traffic flow actually is. So where it's convenient to, to pull in to be able to charge um, the, those vehicles. So looking from 2021 to 2022, by the end of uh, next year, that uh, where that, that's actually increased. But by the time we get to 2030, that there is huge coverage actually all over the, the, the city. and in looking at that in terms of increasing priority, there, there are key areas um, there which are, you know, in, in terms of the darker colour, um, are the areas of the, the highest priority. And a lot of that is the proximity to um, th those links with the key traffic flows, um, those key route networks um, as well, and uh, those amenities and also where the, the highest take up um, actually is. There are other areas, obviously, going throughout the city. Um, and, you know, th that what the strategy will do, hopefully by uh, 2030, 2032, is that we will be at that, that widest coverage. Um, and with those highest priority areas, that will tend to be your um, highest level of um uh, charge points in terms of your fast and rapid those other areas which are the lighter pink which are more residential will have those charge points seven to ten kilowatts um, and in the main a lot of those will actually be the more innovative type of uh, technology um, as well so just moving to uh, the last slide so where we are um, at the at the moment by uh, the, the the end of this year, we would have um, installed, or we have or have already. Um, we're working across 65 sites at the moment, and the first lot that that have now been uh, completed are um, 54 fast uh, chargers and the nine uh, rapid chargers um, in in the box that you can see in, in those particular areas. Um, it has been challenging. I would uh, say, um, because the, the the processes that sit behind putting charge points in, uh, where they are highway sites, um, they require the TRO process um, to to be completed. Where that where they are public sites, um, such as public car parks, there are legal lease arrangements that actually need to be put in place, and also. Uh, there are various processes um, that we've needed to implement, such as Section 115E, Section 15s, uh, to enable uh, deployment to to, um, to happen. Also, um, with the grid connection, we are reliant on WPD um, and their schedule for enabling connections to actually happen. So there have been instances where actually all the work on, on ESB side has been done and we've just simply been waiting for the grid connection from, from WPD. So there are, there are a lot of moving parts to this uh, and every location is different and has different uh, issues that, that um, uh, come with it. And 
you know, some of the latest things that we are dealing with in terms of um, enabling um, more charge points to be put out more quickly um, is those arrangements um, where they align with the city's uh, PFI contracts, where um, there are issues around planning permission, where there's alignment now with planning policy, there is the changing um, uh, planning regulations uh, coming out from, from government in, in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, and I suppose like everybody, you know, we, we have been um, hampered by the, the, the issues of COVID, of Brexit, and more recently by uh, HS2. Um, in, in simple things like, you know, accessing concrete, um, where HS2 seem to have all, all the supplies. So, um, so it's it has been uh, challenging, but um, in it hasn't stopped us identifying sites. We we have a huge amount of uh, sites. As mentioned, we're working across 65 sites, getting them through those first uh, stages of uh, of leases of. Um, section you know whether it's 115b or section 50 uh, requirements and whatever um ready for the for the next tranche of uh, charge points going through and with the, the strategy being approved by cabinet this particularly focused on the approval for the use of public land um and you know obviously with a focus on residential areas with low grid uh, capacity and limited off street parking um and um also in in looking at that focus on communication as well having approval for that but also having the ability to go out for more funding to do more innovative um installations of uh charge point technology um and as i mentioned we are learning from from other cities not everything fits the birmingham scenario um a particular example of that are things like lamppost technology that um Lamp posts have to be of a certain height. They have to be at the back of the uh, at the back of the the uh, sorry on on the curb. Whereas the Birmingham's policy is to have um, lamp posts on the back of uh, the pavement. So there are some areas in Birmingham that still do have them on the curb side, and we will be looking at, at those those particular locations. But um, it's not a general solution to to what we have what we're faced with them um, at the moment so that's why we're um, working on a, a number of projects and evaluation studies to look at what technologies would be suitable and also with the BHERD um, survey it's about collecting that evidence to be able to provide um, the business case for what technology actually needs to go where so that's where where we are with that um, and that's what the the strategy um, is enabling us actually to to do. So that that's the final slide. And uh, any questions? Thanks very much, Sylvia. Yes, very very um, clear, comprehensive description of it. You know, this really crucial piece of work. You know, certainly, in the time that I've known you, you seem to take on some of you know, some of the most you know, um, uh, <laughs> challenging bits of bits of work. You know, the, the work that you've done on on, on taxi um, conversions, etc. So, um, yes, yeah, so yeah. thank you for, for everything yeah. you're doing. Um, Tim has got Councillor Huxtable's got a couple of question, and I had I had a couple of comments. But over to you first, Councillor Huxtable. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, the, the, the presentation was about aligning with the Birmingham Transport Plan and, um, you know, getting that modal shift to public transport. Yeah. Um, so I'm aware of electric charging points at um, park and ride stations, um, or park and ride sites, railway stations, for example, Yardley yeah. Wood in my ward. Um, yeah. One, they're not shown on any maps. Uh, that we've we've seen or wouldn't appear to be and the second is that obviously you're leaving the car there for a considerable period of time so um you know because you're getting the train in presumably to the city center doing a day's work and then coming back out and collecting your electric vehicle so my question is how are we aligning with those types of sites which are obviously within the remit of transport for West Midlands, 
and could we not um, put in more electronic uh, electric charging points um, at our existing park and ride sites um, because the, the two spaces that uh, are available are always full and always in use. Thank you, Chair. OK, so um, firstly, none of the Birmingham charge points from our network at the moment are in the park and ride site. So I think what you're seeing are those which um, have been commissioned by Transport for West Midlands with another provider. Um, we are we have engaged with Transport for West Midlands and we have and, and discussed all Birmingham park and ride sites and we have provided um, a proposal back to Transport for West Midlands, which is under discussion with their projects board or capital board um, about the inclusion of our programme to align with their sites. So the issue to date for Transport for West Midlands has actually been around funding charge points. And apart from what they have in terms of existing, which is what you, you've mentioned, you know, that it's, it's very few and their plans are to increase that to enable that transition. Um, that money isn't there. So for what we are operating um, under the scheme that we have, um, we can provide fast and rapid charge points which will be part of their overall scenario. So quite rightly, there, there will be um, the, the Transport for West Midlands users, you know, of, of the trains who will be parking up and they know they're going to be away for four to eight hours and they plug in and therefore their vehicle is left there. Uh, my understanding from the, the discussions is they want to have more charge points to enable that to happen. But also they recognise that there will be people who are parking up um, that will want to um, have a quick charge as they leave. They don't want to leave their vehicle on charge for eight hours, seven hours or whatever. So this is where a rapid charge point actually comes into the picture, which is what we provide. So literally that will be 20 minutes. Um, so 20, 30 minutes is a zero to full charge. It could be. They only need 10 minutes. Um, so we, the, the, our proposal, you know, the, the discussions of Transport for West Midlands is how can we align what we're doing with what their aspirations are and where we are in terms of fast and rapid aligns with that, not with the whole of the scenario of what Transport for West Midlands wants to do, but part of that. Um, they're also keen to... Um, enable the local communities around those park and ride sites to be able to out of hours to use the charge point facilities and again this is where fast and rapid would come in uh, people wouldn't readily leave their vehicles overnight in in a car park they may do but but maybe not but if you've got fast and rapid it's just there for a specific uh, length of time that you know that they could uh, work around that in terms of whether it's 20, 30 minutes or it's up to two hours if they they wanted to go shopping or, or be visiting or, or whatever. Um, so the discussions are there. We are waiting to hear back from Transport for West Midlands um, for their total agreement and acceptance um, of aligning with our programme. And we're hoping we get that before Christmas. We'll be able to start um, installation straight away after Christmas if, if that is the case but it's certainly an intention to see how we can work with park and ride because it's part of, of, of a bigger picture and also you know it's, it's about a joint objective um, between the council and transport for the West Midlands to enable that transition to, to happen. Thanks very much, Sylvia. Um, yes, um, thanks for addressing that, that question from Council Huxtable. I mean, I just had a, a general comment that when I first saw that you know, the, the the report and the cabinet report, I had some concerns about the phasing of the you know, of the the hub sites vis-a-vis -vis the, the the domestic you know, um, on street charging. But I think you've explained very well why you know, why you know, that why the focus on the you know, the fast rapid sites is um, is so important. And I suppose it's like analogous with you know, people have to drive to a petrol station to um, to fill up their cars, don't they? And 
it will be yes. in, in, like that in a way I suppose because just because of the nature of the you know, the ward I represent I've got a lot of residents you know, who are you know, um, desperate to have charging um, points outside their terraced houses um, and we've got a few instances where people are um, using sort of extension cables and then trailing them across the pavement so it is becoming a, a bit of an issue so I on the other hand, I've seen on social media lots of lots of um, pictures of, of the solutions that are being in other place, used in other council areas. And you mentioned Oxford and Manchester, which are things which are tending to just add to the street clutter on the pavement, which I wouldn't be in favour of. So, what you were describing, in, what you were describing in terms of the, the 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 socket that sort of inlet into the into the into the curb stones, it, it, would it be possible to have some more information about that or some pictures? Because I think that would be of interest to members of the committee and, and councillors more widely. Um, yes, I can forward that information. It's not confirmed. That's what we will use. The thing is, a lot, a lot of this technology is still being piloted um, and evaluations done. And if you're going to have this kind of technology, it is about proving the robustness um, of that technology, the use of that technology um, as well, and actually who benefits and for the particularly with the cost of it and it you know where does that cost come from um where you've only got one person who can only be on it for for eight hours and you know it depends what model that you go under whether or not we're saying well actually in terms of the council we will be footing this or we're saying well actually this is a commercial model there has to be a viability and feasibility even if it's just to cover the maintenance you know, and the connection costs and all the rest of it, you know, there has to be a business model for this. So it is about uh, aligning all, all of those different aspects in terms of what that final solution is. And we are in the final stages of evaluating that Trojan technology. I mean, it, it, it looks great so far, you know, the evaluations are, are good, but um, the last thing which, you know, I have got discussions with, um PFI contract managers is is that so what does this mean you know in terms of putting into the curbstone um, and then that connection to the the grid actually from the from the curbstone and again it's those issues about uh, maintenance about liability responsibility you know on these contracts how long do they they last in terms of uh, the maintenance um, of them and the responsibility. Um, and what we want to make sure, particularly in this, you know, the times that we find ourselves in, in terms of uh, budgets, is actually that financial responsibility doesn't come back to the council. Thanks very much, Sylvia. I'm just aware of time ticking away. So I can see Mike's, Councillor Mike Leddy's got his hand up. So I'll bring Mike in and then I think we'll have to draw it to a close. But M Mike, um, okay. fire away. Uh Thank you, Chair. I, I do think there's a bit of lateral thinking is required in Edwardian built areas of the city. Uh, and I, I can't see why uh, when we are uh, refurbishing some of the uh, footways uh, that we put in uh, ducting channels, that cables going from the residence property out onto the highway can be threaded. Uh, uh, to charge their vehicles. So we could do away uh, with, as the chair's already uh, highlighted, and I know in my own ward, um, cables trailing across pavements. And, you know, going out in some of the places in King's Heath where you've got cables trailing across the pavement to charge a vehicle, um, it can be very dangerous. And, 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 you know, we will be, you know, as culpable as the person who put the cable out. So I think uh, ducting uh, is a way of, of uh, overcoming some of the problems in those areas. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Lady. Quick response from, from Sylvia on that, please. And all I can say is it's difficult, you know, from, from being on the inside of this, if you are supply if, if you are laying ducting from a residence to the curb edge and uh, uh, ostensibly what you're saying is that that your your domestic electric supply is being run from the the domestic property underneath the public highway 
there is that there are issues actually around liability with that but one uh, issue particularly is that it's a public highway anybody can park there so you will have people thinking oh hello <laughs> this looks like a charge point here i will try and plug in and then you know obviously because it's linked to the person's uh, um electric um you know hopefully they, they won't be taking charge from that person's um house it is difficult and we do need to come up with a solution and potentially this tro trojan one potentially could be uh, the solution that that comes out you know on on top here um but where we're trying to get to with the strategy is that this is about trying to provide public accessibility to EV charge points. So we would hope that for those areas particularly, that very close by, there, there are public facilities that enable the, the possibility to charge at least within 20 minutes uh, to be able to do that in the same way if you had, you know, um, an internal internal combustion vehicle you go to your nearest uh, petrol station to to fill up thanks very much sylvia i think the petrol station analogy is quite helpful isn't it because i think you know we haven't all got you now or an individual petrol station but we hopefully you know in a city have got them um in 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 easy easy to reach distances yeah. you know, for, for most yeah. people OK, well, I'd like to thank you very much for, for taking us through that, you know, that, that strategy, you know, and, and I think we've got a good understanding you know, of, of just how complex this you know, um, implementing it is, um, but just also how crucial it is for, for, the, for the city in, in achieving mode shift and all the objectives of the, the Birmingham transport strategy. So I've got no doubt yeah. that um, the committee will be coming back to you um, over the next few years as this, as this develops. But thank you very much um, for the presentation today. I certainly found that really um, interesting and it's certainly an issue that I'm getting more and more um, inquiries from residents and, and, and constituents on. So thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and yes, thanks for battling with the, the um, um, technology difficulties as well. OK, then, so it's just slightly overrunning, for which I apologise. Um, the, the work programme has been circulated with the agenda papers. Coming up in January, we will be revisiting the issues to do with the um, with highways, but this time focusing on the on the PFI contract itself and the renegotiations. And we'll also be talking about the clean air strategy. So has anyone got any um, questions or queries about the work programme um, for the remainder of the year? No. Okay, so I'm not. Yes, um, thanks for confirming that, Eddie. I'm not seeing any other raised hands or or um, queries. So um, yeah, we'll we'll um, move forward on the on the work program as as um, Basim has set it out in the in the papers. So um, the last thing I think I'll need just just going back to the agenda, just toggling screens. Um, have we got any other urgent business items? Any anything that anybody wants to raise? Councillor Huxtable. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, it, it came to my attention that at Cabinet yesterday, a uh, local improvement budget was passed. And I've been trying to get some answers on this one, and um, but not with any joy. And the big question is, is the local improvement budget in addition to or subst a substitution of the Ward Minor Transport Measures Fund? That's a good question. I think if we could ask um, Asima maybe to, to um, forward on the query and, and ask for clarification on that. Um, I yes, Be because the local improvement budget, if you read the cabinet report, talks about there for um, uh, ward minor transport issues and applications can be made for up to 50,000. Well, as we know, that in a single member ward, you get 10,000 at the moment, and in a dual member ward, you get 20,000. If the budget is exactly the same, which it appears to be, i.e. 1 million, um, then um, if one ward gets, if a single member ward gets 50,000 for one project, it means that potentially four other wards miss out. Um, and it, it, I think it's a, it's a question that needs to be clarified urgently 
is it in addition to or a substitution for? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thanks for raising that, Tim. I think we need to get yes, get get some clarification on that because certainly the ward minor transport measures you know, is something you know, that um, I, I find very valuable in in my own ward, I and mean, we've certainly got you know, a, um, a whole list of you know, projects on a wait list that we're hoping to get funded by that. But it's got to be done on a you know, um, on a fair basis across the city. So I don't think I know, you know the answer to the, the question you've just posed, but we'll try and find out for you. Um, and then we'll have Kevin back in the meeting in January just on the PFI stuff. So that if there's any questions relating to that, we could ask um, him or, or seek further um, clarification from the cabinet member. Well, um, um, can I help is that if we can get an answer to that urgently, then uh, we could um, think about because January is too late. You can't call a decision in that late. So if if it is a substitution for, uh, then there may be grounds for certainly my group, and we welcome anyone else, um, to um, call the decision in uh, to get to seek greater clarity uh, as to the aspiration. But the Cabinet report is, is particularly unclear on this point, I feel. Okay, I think Asima's already indicated in the chat that she can follow that up for us. So I'm, I'm sort of battling against my own broadband now. It's just packed up and I'm back on my phone. Um, but yes, we'll follow that up because I'd certainly, if it's as you uh, suspect or are worried about Tim, I would also be concerned. So yeah, let's let's follow that up. Hello? I said, uh, so thank you, Chair. Yeah, that's great. OK, so does anyone have any any other any other questions or queries? OK, if that's not the case, then I think the final thing that I can do is wish everybody a really um, happy, healthy and, and peaceful Christmas and New Year. Um, stay safe, everybody. And uh, let's hope that um, 2022 is a better year. I'm sure we you know, wish that last year as well, but we just have to just hope for the best things in the in the new year. And I look forward to, you know, uh, another series of interesting meetings in, in 2022 and see you, see you in the new year. And thanks to the officers for all their support um, during the year. Um, um, we're very lucky to have you know, uh, Basima and Kerry um, supporting this committee um, and had excellent support. So thanks everybody and um, happy Christmas and a good new year. Thank you very much. Happy Chair. Christmas. Take care of you all. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thanks. Thank, Chair, you. And you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.